Okay, so I have the top of the hour. Hi, folks, and welcome to the pre-conference. This is our first track of the pre-conference, so a uh, special welcome to everybody to the conference week in general. My name is Gene. I'm going to be the moderator for this session, so you are going to watch a presentation by Bill Erickson, uh, read us and beyond. I'd like to first uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, have different uh, screens up, so let me get to my notes. All right, so we'd like to thank our champion sponsors, Equinox for the platform, ECDI for closed captioning, which will be posted in uh, the feed loop and Zoom chat um, periodically throughout the presentation, and Kipu for the Hackfest. We'd like to also uh, have a special thanks to Mobius and Stack Courier as our sponsors for the pre-conference. So uh, the pre-conference is sponsored by uh, both Mobius and Stack Courier. So thank you very much for everybody's support and um, ongoing efforts of keeping this conference um, alive uh, with your sponsorships and uh, with your um, effort. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there will be closed captioning links uh, in English that will be posted in uh, both of the chats. Um, as uh, Jeff also mentioned in the chat on Feedloop, uh, there is a way to join uh, Zoom. So if you do have uh, any questions about that, um, you can see that comment or just uh, post a comment in chat and we could uh, get you to the right place. Um, this is also recorded and will be posted uh, sometime after the conference is over. Okay, so I'm just going to stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, Bill, whenever you're ready, you could go on ahead. Okay, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yes. Okay, thanks. I popped over to the the Zoom app uh, instead, so see how that works out. Let's see here. Okay, do you see um browser there? Uh, yeah, that's coming through. Okay. And do you see this other tab that I just tried? Uh, yes. Yep. For okay. your terminal. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. No okay. Let me resize some stuff, move some things around. All right. Um, so let's see if I can still keep the old chat window up. Kind of like seeing that too. Mm. Although I wonder if this chat window is the same as the chat window everyone else is using. We'll see. Uh, anyway, so yeah, as far as uh, chatting and stuff goes, I'll, I'm going to try to keep an eye on it. But um, also feel free to, um, you know, let me know if someone's asking questions or anything like that, or just shout stuff out. This is not a rigorous presentation, so it's going to kind of meander through a couple of different areas. So feel free to grab me at any time and um, ask questions at any time. So. The uh, topic today is a combination of two different uh, two different topics. I was originally going to do a talk on Rust uh, and some code that I've been working on at uh, King County that's uh, built on Rust. Uh, but then there was also a lot of interest in talking more about Redis since we are, you know, getting closer and closer to actually uh, people using it in the wild. And I think there may actually be some people using it in the wild already. Uh, so there was some interest in having a little bit more discussion of that and to talk about some of the more advanced features and um, sysadmin type stuff. So um, what I did is I just combined the two into one. They are somewhat related. The uh, the Rust stuff depends on the Redis stuff. So I'm going to start out talking about Redis, and then that'll kind of be the first half, and then I'll move over into Rust on the second half. Um, so good old Redis. The project is a couple of years old now on the Evergreen side to replace uh, Jabber, eJabberD, XMPP, all of that messaging layer down at the bottom with a product called Redis, um, which is, you know, I guess to put it in the simplest terms, it's just much leaner and faster than eJabberD, at least for the ways that we are using it. Um, and uh, it turned out that it worked out, started working out really well. So we went ahead and there's, uh, of course, a launch pad ticket for this. The Evergreen parts have been merged into 3.12 and above. So if you are on Evergreen 3.12 and above, you can install the OpenSurf branch 
that runs the Redis code and it'll work with Evergreen. You just have to make a couple of changes and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to that slide. And then on the OpenSurf part, uh, it is pending a merge into op OpenSurf main. Um, we're still sort of figuring out the timing with that. Um, you know, how's it gonna affect versioning? Do we want to do it before or after this release or that release? So it seems um, pretty straightforward as far as whether it's going to be merged. I don't think there's a lot of question about that anymore. It's more a question of how and when do we want to do it? And how do we kind of set up those demarcation points in Evergreen to indicate which open surfs you can work with versus those that require maybe a couple of extra steps to use Redis or Jabber under the covers. The recent news on the Redis front is, as with a lot of um, open source projects out there, they are going through some relicensing. And um, I don't pretend to understand the details of what exactly they're saying you can and can't do. But suffice to say, it's upsetting <laughs> and enough to make a lot of people question whether or not Redis proper is going to work going down the road for open source projects. Uh, and especially for people that maybe host other uh, host other entities on their servers, it gets a little bit murky with licensing there. So fortunately, uh, because the Redis code has been open source um, up to essentially the code that we're running, there are a couple of forks of it. And one fork in particular called Valky, which um, has been sort of the, it seems to be the, the version of Redis, the implementation of Redis that we, are kind of coalescing on and we being the open source community at large not just uh not just on the evergreen side um so that project is over on github right now and it's under valky io slash valky and it is uh as you might imagine currently undergoing a, a a pretty rushed um flurry of commits to um sort of rebrand all of the redis stuff over into um to calling it Valky essentially. So they're going, you can see all the instances here of replace Redis with Valky, replace Redis with Valky. So they're kind of rebranding all the stuff now. And then once all of that settles down, I imagine we'll see more, more motion toward um, packaging and all of that kind of stuff. But suffice to say the, the Redis package that you get on, for example, Ubuntu 22, which is what I've been doing all of my dev on recently is fine it's still using the old license it's it's you know it's acceptable to use that it's this is more of a we need to migrate away from redis toward something that's fully open source and this is the likely endpoint for it um, and as noted in chat uh, chris said this is supported by the linux foundation so that gives it a little bit of extra uh, uh, community uh, involvement there so it's I, I have installed this I have run it it was a drop in replacement for Redis um, even more so than the uh, the other one we, that was mentioned before that I can't think of the name of now uh, but this one I just plopped it right in make make install and it just goes uh, it'll probably get slightly harder in the short term as they do all the rebranding change config file names and all of that but eventually once they get all of that done get everything documented we'll um, we can base our documentation on their documentation, or at least refer to their documentation. KeyDB, I think that's what it was called, says Blake. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, a story that's, um, you know, it's progressing. Uh, but right now, for the purposes of today, I'm just going to use the word Redis. It's in all the documentation. It's in the code. It's in the dev VMs that I'm running. So we'll make that migration to Valky when the time comes. And again, it's the same code. So it's just a little bit of admin type work that needs to be done and some packaging and documentation before we can really migrate that over. For anyone that wants to experiment with the Redis code, um, there are at least these two options that I am well aware of. The first one is the Ansible installer, which is my project, which is why I get to put it at the top of the slide. Um, and then there's the Docker images. Um, and you know they both serve slightly different purposes the ansible is essentially just running on a vm docker lets you build docker images and run those in the uh, docker containers so if there's anything else blake wants to say about the docker stuff uh you're welcome to to say that blake um but i've um but the documentation is all here and it's all very thorough so uh for those of you interested in using the docker stuff there is a a redis 
build in here that you can do. The key differences um, once when you're migrating from Evergreen to Redis, or sorry, from eJavaD or Java to Redis, there's a couple of config files that have to be changed slash, at least you need to be aware of how they work for administering the servers. So it's fortunately, it's not a lot. Um, the OpenSurf API itself behaves the same as far as the applications are concerned. It's just that lower level messaging bit. And that requires a couple of different tweaks on the config side. So the first is the Redis accounts file. The um, Redis server supports connecting without authentication. By default, that's what it does. You can just connect to it if you have the IP and port and you have a Redis client, you can connect. But they also support something um, called ACLs, access control lists, so that you can define um, access permissions, um, authorization for different logins and what those logins can do. And to give you a quick glimpse of what that file looks like, I have my little SSH portal running here in the browser. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is the this is the um, the Redis accounts file. The kind of way that I learned to add comments was to simply set a key. So the set comment just sets a key in the in the Redis database, and you can just keep replacing it. So I've added a bunch of comments here to describe what these individual accounts do, and to try to describe what kind of access they should have. So um, the most basic chunk here is we have an account we have named OpenSurf, and that's just for consistency with the existing evergreen setup we usually have an open surf account we apply a password and then we define the permissions and just in a nutshell these permissions are get rid of all permissions followed by grant these permissions followed by these permissions are granted on keys that begin with this so they're wildcard keys in this case so the OpenSurf user can communicate to the router, the service, and the client sort of, it's not really a domain, but it's sort of a subsection of um, the messages that go across the, uh, the Embratus bus. We give them, the prefixing is all done by us. We can define the format of that however we want to, the, uh, but it just makes it handy for applying permissions and for segmenting sections of the, of the messages so that, for example, if you have, where is it, the gateway. So the gateway is um, something that runs generally, typically on the public side of things. And it has a slightly narrower function in that it's really just a client. It's not a service or anything like that. So we give it even fewer permissions than a service would get. So all it can do is talk to send requests to the router and send replies to um, clients. Um, or have, I guess, stateful communication with clients. It can't send anything directly to a service. Uh, Redis itself would block that communication. And um, as far as these passwords are concerned, by default, when you build Evergreen with the Redis branch going, or the Redis stuff installed with OpenSurf and Evergreen, it will generate random passwords each time you run the installer um, using just the UUID command on Linux, and it'll just plop those into this file. So it's it's random and chaotic. Uh, and I'll talk a second about how we can how you can change those if you want simpler passwords. The um, unsurprisingly the open source core file, which also contains these passwords, is affected by this. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up that. pop down to the section where we're doing um, logging into the uh, network here. The um, big changes, different port number could be the same if you wanted to change the Redis config, but um, for clarity, I'd assume that it'd be easier just to change the OpenSurf config to use the default Redis port. Passwords here, these passwords are gonna match what's in the um, Redis accounts file. And then, that's just about it, I think. Username, password, port. 
the domain and host type stuff is going to be the same as you would with uh, regular Jabber. The big difference, or one big difference here, is that on the gateway side, specifically because we want to limit the access the gateway has since it's, it's sitting on you know the internet um, and talking generally to public services only, there is a new username for the gateway. Before, this would have been OpenSurf, um, but now there is a gateway user so that we could take advantage of those Redis access control list specifically for this user. And then lastly, the surf shell config, which is basically the same thing as the open surf core. It just has username password stuff. So you'd need to change that too if you started with a Jabber Evergreen instance and then moved over to Redis. So very briefly, if you do want to change passwords, I can walk through an example of that. Um, do I have stuff running over here? Uh, do. OK, so let me shut all this down. So one of the um, ways that we modify Redis, really it's the only way we modify it right now, um, at least to get the most basic system running is we disable um, persistence. So the messages that go through Redis are ephemeral. They're simply meant to be delivered immediately or whenever the, whenever the recipient requests the messages sent right to them. Um, there's no reason for Redis to store that stuff to disk. You could, there is some potential there for additional failover type options. Um, but by default, I've opted in the branch to disable that as part of the documentation, because uh, it seems like it's probably not worth the added disk IO needed to do it. It's the messages generally go and leave and go and leave, and they're not sticking around. Um, but one of the benefits of that is that simply restarting Redis will completely wipe everything out. It'll wipe out anything you set up as far as accounts, stuff like that. So you can just, anytime your Redis is, if it's not acting right, uh, one thing you can do is just restart it. Um, is this font big enough? Should I, I can probably make this a little bit bigger here. Or not. There we go. Okay, I'll go ahead and make it a little bit giant. All right. Restarted the Redis server. And let's see, previous tab, there we go. Modify whatever passwords you want to modify. So in that case, that would be, oops. Well, I'm already there. So. New password. And then you have to do the same thing with the Redis accounts file. Now, when I tell it to start again, it will the open source control script will recognize that it was not able to connect to Redis, and then it will force it to reset and reload those accounts from the Redis accounts file. And it shows you there where it's logging that it's resetting. And then just to make sure everything's still working. Oh, I didn't change Surfshell. That's right. Okay, so now we're back in business with a different password. Same process for the gateway and the um, default. The uh, one thing to mention here, the default account, this comes with Redis by default and it comes without a password. As I mentioned before, if you don't authenticate, you're essentially logged in with default with complete access to everything. So, um, I went ahead and opted to make sure that the default account also requires a password so that you can log in with that. And that's sort of the super user. But once we give it a password, you can't log in without it. So that's critical.
And then I already did all that, the restarting and the restarting of Evergreen. There's documentation in the Evergreen 3.12 release notes that defines how one can migrate from Jabber to Redis. And the, um, some of these steps are, you don't need all of them if you're already running 3.12. For example, it says to run the um, prerequisites, make file installer, which is not necessary if you're already running 3.12 because it'll, it'll, you'll be doing that anyway. Um, but if you're running something like 3.11 and you wanted to do Redis into that, then these are the steps you would go through. And so they're baked into the 3.12 notes. Um, and it's, it's fairly there. So it's about a page and a half of stuff, mostly with config changes. Uh, sorry, Bill, there was a couple of questions that came in through the feed loop chat. Sure. Uh, one from Gene, what happens if there is a password mismatch? In other words, how does it let you know about errors? Um, if there were a password mismatch, Okay, so if you if you had it in the Redis accounts file and you register the accounts correctly, but you didn't have it correctly in OpenServe Core, for example, then probably it's going to not give a super amazing helpful answer, but we'll see. Hey, look at that. That's actually super helpful. So it died pretty quickly there with the wrong password. Um, and actually, now that I see that, I recall that because OpenSurf control needs to check the password before it can start services, it does that and then dies early. Now, if let's see what happens if it was different bad password. Say on the gateway. So that's a little bit different. So this would probably lead to an error in the open surf logs saying that the gateway couldn't connect or something to that effect. Which I will check in a second after it runs through its little startup here. What do we have? All right. I just I recently changed the um the locale of the time the time zone on here, so it's creating all kinds of fun files. And I just set these VMs up too, so they're not really. Uh, okay, well, that is from earlier. Yeah, I'm not, okay, so yeah. <laughs> uh, one of them will give you a clean answer. The other one probably needs to sh yell a little bit louder. Or you know what, I haven't even started the gateway. I didn't start the gateway because I haven't restarted Apache. Okay, so there we do get some invalid username password pair stuff in the logs. Um, uh, let's see here. Where did I leave it? Now oh, we do want to see <laughs> bouncing around. Were there any other uh, questions? Uh, yes, there was one more. All right, this is from Galen. Um, is it possible to operate without a default account that has access to everything? 
Yes. Well, you can certainly create accounts that have access to everything and give them a different name. I don't know if you can just get rid of the default account. Uh, actually, you know what? You can. Uh, there is a disable. There is. I'm pretty sure that there's a disable option in the Redis ACLs. Um, let me find that link real quick. Or you could simply create the, or you could do the same thing that we're doing here. And um, just uh, pass in another line down at the bottom. That's basically like this. And just get rid of all the permissions. And then the account can't do anything. And then if you wanted to create some other account that had a less obvious name, whoops. Sorry, my in browser commands here are a little odd. Uh, then you would just replace default with something. And then give it whatever, all the commands or whatever else you want to give it. Anything else? Uh, that's it for now, but I'll let you know later. Thank you. Okay, we looked at that. And then back to some debugging tools. The um, You can connect directly to the command line for Redis. And you do that like so. Find the, the account that you want to connect as. And if you just connect as default, that gives you access to everything. So uh, that's why I'm using that. Um, there's probably nothing in there. So, um, but if you connect as one of the users, this Redis CLI auth option here changes a little bit. I forget what the exact invocation is, but you have to provide the um, username as well. Or it's possible that you provide the password this way and then provide the username in the actual command line. But you can dig around in here and see whatever data is around, see what's going on. And then my favorite, of course, is the monitor action. So um, this just basically tells you everything that's happening. And you'll see here, uh, interestingly enough, that there is a lot happening, somewhat surprisingly. And the reason for that is the Redis libraries um, do not, they, they basically, under the covers, handle signals. So SIG in, SIG kill, all that stuff in a way that doesn't allow you to make them sort of stop. So the code instead is doing, it, it'll listen, and block for five seconds by default, although that value can change. Um, and then it'll wake up every five seconds to see if there has been some signal or some indication that something needs to happen. So that's why you'll see it doing this um, every five second checking. So, and you'll also notice that whenever I restart uh, services, it doesn't happen quite as quickly as it did with Jabber. Whereas with Jabber, you would send a signal and it would immediately wake up and start cleaning everything up. And in these, it doesn't, um, find those signals until it's done its five second sleep and then wake up to see the signals. So there's some benefit to that in that it's uh, handling signals in line is always a problematic thing, um, especially in C code, because it can tend to lead to things happening in odd orders that are not necessarily safe. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the Rust side too in a little bit. But if I go to the catalog, I may need to restart. Uh, maybe I did. Just see if it's running. Okay, I did, yeah. So go back over to the monitor. We can do some queries and then we'll see all the messages coming through. So unsurprisingly, all the data is stored as JSON. And the um, so we can see every time 
someone wants to pop something off of an array, all of the messaging uh, infrastructure at this point is array based. So you're pushing onto the end of an array and you are popping off the front of an array or shifting depending on how you uh, want to define it. But the uh, Redis commands are lpop for left pop and rpop for right pop and then rpush and lpush. So we're generally doing rpush to push something on the end, lpop pull something off the front so the messages stay in the order in which they were received. If you are having issues and something just isn't making sense, this is one tool that's really useful to uh, make sure that stuff is happening down here that you think should be happening. I wouldn't run this all the time. Um, it's probably adds some overhead, just having it constantly log all this stuff, especially under high traffic. But um, I have I have certainly run it where you pipe it to a file and let it go for a while and then come back and review the file and done some debugging in there. It's, you know, it's extremely helpful. So this is one of the better commands that comes out of the box. But you can also just do fun stuff in here. Uh, there's a whole host of commands you can run for diagnosing things um, or just testing things or what have you. The uh, documentation for Redis is really quite good. And uh, the documentation is baked into the code itself. So I see the same docs more or less over on the Valky side and on the KeyDB side when I was looking at that. So I don't expect that to change. The way in which routing occurs in the Redis setup is uh, via addresses. So an address matches a, um, this is an address, for example. And the addresses have a certain function, or certain structure, depending on the function of each address. Generally speaking, there's routers, there's services, service endpoints, I should say, and clients. And routers and service endpoints have to have well-defined addresses so that clients know how to find them, and so that routers know how to find services. So that's what some of the structure is required here for. Um, so the basic structure is we have a prefix. I just we're just using OpenSurf. Prefix is not required. It helps a little bit maybe with some of the ACL stuff and uh, defining per permissions, but this is just added here as part, if nothing else, just for cleanliness and and whatnot. But we could easily live without the OpenSurf bit. Uh, the second part is the purpose of the address. That's going to be router, service, or client at this point. Um, and then on the router, the name field is matches the router name. So when you install Evergreen by default, there is a field called the router name in the OpenSurf core in a couple of different spots. And by default, it's just router. But if you change the name, then you uh, have a situation where you can run multiple routers on one domain that serve a different population of clients. So that's um, an option there. So that's why we have the router name in the address. And then followed by the primary domain that the router serves. So if you are a C store service running on private.localhost, uh, then the router on private.localhost is one of the places you're presumably going to send your registration request to so that that router knows that you're running on that domain. And then similarly, services, same kind of breakdown, prefix purpose, username here is just really just the username in the open source core. And it's largely here and with the client for uh, consistency across all address types. And then again, the domain is always the fourth entry. And then after that, it varies. In this case, it's going to be the service name for services. So this is the endpoint for sending API calls to open ILSC store on the private.localhost domain. Um, and then on the client side, this last stuff here after the domain is just really sort of to add a bit of debugging and randomness. So the host name that this client's on, the process ID it's running in, and then a bit of random numbers to guarantee randomness throughout. But you will see these uh, frequently in the, um, in the OpenServe logs. So there's a disconnecting from a router. Um, so these will be this this is roughly equivalent to what you would see in the Jabber side, where it'd be username at domain slash, I think it was called resource. And the resource in that case would 
help define the purpose of the address. And in this case, it's the same kind of thing, just a slightly different structure. And there's nothing special about the colons or the way this is laid out. Redis will allow for pretty much any kind of key that you want in there. It doesn't really matter what the format is. It just seemed like a relatively straightforward way to provide some namespacing and, and clarity on what the purposes of the address were. And then there's one special address, and this is the generic service endpoint address. So when you are a client and you wish to send a request to CStore, as a client, you don't really care where CStore is, what domain it's on, it doesn't really matter. So there's no reason to encode that information on the address. Instead, I chose just an underscore as a wildcard. It could be anything that isn't a colon character, essentially. Um, but the point is that you send this to the router, the router sees, oh, service, and the router sees, oh, CStore, and then the router determines where to route that message based on which services have registered with the router already. So this will be something that pops up from time to time, and all it really means is the client is trying to go to CStore service and does not care how it gets there. Let's see if we, that shows up anywhere in the logs now. Yeah, okay, so there's some examples of it. The router routing a message from a client to this address, and then before it actually sends it, it looks up in its own sort of routing tables and replaces the underscores with appropriate values and then sends the message onto that address. So one thing that um, the eJeopardy code did that um, the Rust, or sorry, not Rust, the um, Redis code did initially, or sorry, the Redis code did not do initially, was a, a high availability framework wherein you can have services um, connect across domains, and not only across domains, but even on the same domain using different router names. Uh, if you recall, I mentioned the router name before, and this is one of the places where it can come into effect. So some of that was supported in Redis, but not the full extent of it. So that has since been remedied and is a part of the, um, the working code on Launchpad. Uh, and since it's a little bit more advanced, I thought I would walk through an example of what that looks like and kind of why you would use it and how to set it up and things like that. So some of this is the same way you would do, uh, I'm gonna call it mesh just because it's a short word. Um, so. Um, high availability, HA, whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to say mesh, it's quick. Uh, so some of the ways in which you set it up in Redis are the same ways that you would set it up in eJeopardy. So you have to have in anything that is part of a sort of a mesh is going to have to be able to speak to other things that are in the mesh. So in the most simplest case, let's say you have two servers, two VMs, whatnot, they will need their Redis instance listening on a routable IP address. So not local host, but presumably an internal IP address that they can all route on. And that information will need to be, um, you know, configured in a way so that they each know how to talk to each other, either via IP addresses or having host names with um, IPs in, in uh, the host file or in local DNS. So that part's the same. And you can see here on my server, I just have these running on internal routable IP addresses. Some things that are different, because of the way the communication breaks down, uh, the passwords and usernames do have to be consistent across the nodes in the mesh. Previously, with eJabberD, a client would log into Jabber, and then if that client needed to send a message to a different domain, Jabber would mediate that transaction or the communication. So the client would only ever log into its local Jabber and then Jabber would forward the message on to another domain via server to server communication. Um, so that's not the way Redis works. That's not, it's not the way we have the mesh set up going. Instead, because there isn't a sense, we don't have that centralized Jabber routery type thing happening that can talk to other domains endpoints that need to communicate with other domains instead will connect to them directly. So because of that, the username passwords in the core file, in the Redis accounts file, 
um, and in any other files that commun that configure connections across the different domains have to have the same username and um, password. So that's uh, a critical change there. And this truly amazing picture, I'm sure is going to make things clear as mud, um, but it's an attempt to explain the steps involved for a kind of a mesh setup where you are in fact talking across multiple domains, multiple Redis instances. Um, and the, the steps along the right pretty much explain what it is, but what it boils down to is if you try to send a request, your local router does not have a local instance of that API service running. If it needs to, it will open a request or open a connection to the remote Redis instance and send the request to the remote service because that remote service has presumably already told the router that it exists. So this is a case where you have a router connecting to a remote Redis instance to get the request through to the service. And then the service itself connecting to Redis 1 in this case so that it can send the, re the response back to the client. And if you're in a situation where this is happening fairly frequently or at all, really, then it'll it'll cache those connections. So the service listeners or whoever opens a connection to a remote instance, the routers being the main ones, they will keep those connections open so that um, they don't have to reconnect every time. But um, that sort of gives you a little bit of a sense of what's going on there. Um, and I put this together fairly quickly. <laughs> so apologies for the rudimentary uh, nature of it. Okay. So I thought I'd demo a little bit the mesh stuff, just you know, put my money where my mouth is. Uh, so I'm gonna I have two VMs running here. I have my EG Valkyo one and my EG Valkyo two. I'm just gonna stop everything real quick. Okay. And they are both configured with, oh wait, I just recurred, occurred to me that I changed the password on the one. So let me see. I will need to make sure that that is fixed. Go ahead and copy this password over to here. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, just making sure that's the right spot. So, okay, everything should be stopped. I'm going to, so passwords are seen, the running on routable IP addresses, the OpenSurf core file um, has instructed the clients, the service clients, I should say, to register with my local public Valkyo one router, and then my remote public Valkyo two router is going to be the target for registration for all of these services here. And then on Valkyo one, it's registering with its uh, local private router and sending it over to that private router. So I'm going to start just the router on these real quick. And that way the router's up and running before anything else tries to register. Okay. And then I'll tell it to start services. Same thing over here. Give that a second to start. These are not especially beefy VMs. Oh, wait, I have it registering over here, I think.
Hmm. Did I miss something? I did turn the logging down. That may be it. I'll try it, see what happens. Uh, shut it back down over here. Get that router going again. Let's see. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So we start to see communication from the Valkyo one domain. And this is the log file for the Valkyo 2 router. So just want to make sure we're seeing stuff happening across the domains here um, before I do any kind of test. So now I just want to start services over here. So now we have services running on two domains. They're both routing or they're both registered with routers across both domains. All right, so now if we go to surf shell and I just do like a login, okay, that's fine. No big surprises there. I wouldn't really expect to see that impacting the router over here on O2 because by default, it's gonna send the, the route the messages to its local instance of auth and C store, et cetera, when I'm doing a login on O1. Uh, but if I go in here and let's see, Now I'll just stop all the services. So we can stop services on 01, all the deregistrations coming through, deregistrations on the router at 02. Go back to my surf shell and I can still do stuff. Uh, and that's because we are now sending the requests over to the router on 02 because all of the services on 01 have been shut down. Um, so does it does do the thing. Um, I have not spent nearly as much time in this kind of mesh setup to verify there aren't some edge cases that don't work properly, but the uh, the basics should all be there. And from everything I'm seeing in the logs and the behavior, it's sort of working as I would expect. Uh, let me just double check. Let's see. Let's try this. Make sure we can route via the UI as well. There we go. Okay, just took a second. Like I said, they're not beefy. But uh, so this is Apache, et cetera, running on 01, getting all of its data from 02. Okay. And then lastly, on the Redis discussion before I'll pause for questions, um, there's some other stuff we can do. We've talked in the past about using Redis as a replacement for memcache. I have an initial branch for this. I haven't opened a launchpad ticket yet, um, but I will do that shortly. Uh, the, the branch right now is just is a proof of concept, uh, but the part two of the work is gonna revolve getting the authentication pieces in place too, because memcache is just open. It doesn't require authentication. We could do the same with Redis as a replacement for memcache, but it already knows how to log in and stuff. So I figure we may as well take advantage of the added security there. 
um, but that'll that'll require maybe a little bit of discussion on Launchpad because right now we have Redis configs, for example, in the Apache config. So you know we'd have to put the username password stuff in there or access it from some other way. Um, or really, maybe that'll be going away soon enough anyway, because I think that only the translator uses that, which is deprecated. So maybe not a big of a deal. Um, other stuff we could do, we've talked about persistent auth sessions in the past. If we have a Redis instance running with disk persistence enabled so that everything that goes to it is written to disk and synchronized to disk, then we could store auth sessions in Redis instead of we had talked before about putting them in the database. This would be a little bit lighter weight. Um, and the advantage there is if we restart Redis, it would still have that data. So even if there was a small outage on the Redis side, or if you just needed to restart it for some reason, it wouldn't kill all your auth sessions the way Memcache does now if you restart Memcache. And then similarly, uh, the SIPTA Mediator project, which is still pending out in Launchpad land, it is coded to store sessions in the database because the auth sessions need to be long lived. But um, it would, in my opinion, probably be better just sending those over to a Redis instance than it would be storing them in the database. So same kind of thing. All right, um, that's the first half of this. So I'm happy to pause here, take some questions, and then maybe even take five if anyone wants to stretch your legs for a minute. Uh, there was one that came through chat from Mike. Can users and new ACLs be added at any time using the default account or similar, or must they be set up at Redis server start? They could be added anytime. Yes. So if you, as long as you have the password to the default account and can log in with this password, then you can use the, these ACL commands directly in the Redis CLI interface and modify the accounts and add accounts. Okay, um, well, how about we take five? Give everybody a chance to stretch. Um, and I will be back at about three minutes till two.
Right. I realize now I should have left the uh, feed loop window up. I feel very lost. <laughs> I'm going to assume I'm clear to proceed. You're good whenever you want to be. OK, thank you. So the second half uh, of this is a little bit more um, me sort of cheerleading and trying to show some stuff off. Um, so when we first started talking about Rust, or sorry, Redis, a while back, I had mentioned that part of the learning uh, curve, not learning curve, but part of the experience of that for me was also working with Rust, the programming language. And um, I had done some of the early work for Evergreen to talk to Redis using Rust, specifically using the router and some other stuff that I'll talk about today. Um, so there was kind of a, I would say a real, a moderately half-hearted attempt on my part to move in the direction of using Rust for the router and possibly other stuff at the time. But it really was pretty clear that if we went that route, it was going to significantly set back Redis adoption by itself. And Redis by itself is, in my opinion, really good and positive and, and wonderful thing that's going to come out of all of this. I didn't want the Rust stuff to slow it down. So I uh, ended up um, implementing the last little bits of the Redis stuff that we needed in C with the idea that we could maybe revisit Rust down the road. So. Um, in the meantime, I've been continuing to learn uh, the language and uh, work on lots of little projects. And um, I thought I would discuss some of those here for this session. And maybe we can talk about interest on the community side toward whether or not we want to adopt Rust as a kind of a first level language. The um, some in some ways we've discussed it in the past as a um, initially as a replacement for C components, um, but with the potential for expanding beyond that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the language, a little bit how what I'm doing on uh, our projects, and some of the kind of additions that I've added to some well-known pieces that are an attempt to encourage people to want to try it. <laughs> um, so uh, First of all, what's what's language about and why on earth do we want to use it? There's tons of great documentation online about the benefits of the language. And um, they all boil down to, for the most part, a handful of things that are largely related to security and um, that kind of stuff. But there's more to it than that. So the first big one is memory safety. Uh, if you've written a lot of C code or any C code or C++ or similar languages like that, you are well aware that um, there are scenarios where you can write code that's not very safe in that you are accessing memory that's uninitialized. Remember, you shouldn't be accessing. And this is a common entry point for um, bad actors. Uh, it's a way to take advantage of insecure software. So this is one of the aspects of the language that it simply does not allow. The way it implements the compiled down code is all of the protections around the memory you have access to are in the final binary. So there's no runtime checking of any of this stuff. It's just built in a way that you simply can't talk to stuff that you can't talk to. The other big thing, thread safety, and this is largely based on um, limitations on how threads can share information, which is another big issue with uh, multi-threaded applications. Things tend to be shared globally a lot of times. Um, and then you have multiple different components talking to the same data and things get out of sync, or you have a lot of um, like semaphore type stuff where you're blocking and waiting on something to happen. And then you get in thread locking situations. Uh, so the, a lot of effort was done on, on the Rust side to prevent that kind of thing. Communication between threads is very regimented. It compiles down to uh, machine code in the same way that C, C++ does. So you're going to have similar performance errors you do on those languages. It does 
compile and run fine in Windows and Mac and Linux. The um, build system that comes with it, it's called Cargo, and it makes it really, really simple to just get going out of nothing. You're not having to manually, you know, put include paths and make files and do all that kind of stuff at all. It just sort of packages it all up for you and makes it a lot easier just to get started. Um, documentation tests. I think this is really, really cool. I'm sure there's got to be other languages that do this, but, I, but for me, this is one of the neatest things. I'll show it, um, uh, an example of that in a minute. And then finally, uh, I, I believe the Rust community is um, a good uh, stalwart <laughs> community. Um, they seem to have, you know, their, uh, the, the pieces in place there to grow uh, and to evolve. I haven't been to a Rust conference yet, though, but that, that will be one of my next ones. So um, I've seen a fair amount of stuff coming out of Google. They, they are doing a big push to migrate a lot of C and C++ to Rust, partly just to see if it's going to work. And um, one of the things that caught my attention was this particular article that was a, a reference to a presentation that one of the uh, the Google engineers did. I don't remember what where the presentation was, but um, they talked about how um, you know they do all the surveys to make sure is is the code working for you. How confident do you feel? And the one thing that really jumped out was the how confident do you feel that your team's Rust code is correct? And this to me is almost the most important thing that I've walked away from uh, having used the code or having used the language for a couple of years now is that when you write something, you get it, you know, you make the compiler happy, you get it where it needs to be. By the time you have something that runs, it is, I mean, surprising how often it just does the exact thing you've told it to do. It, it, it's really kind of shocking. And I think this is the thing that's really stuck with me the most over the last couple of years is the level of confidence I have that it's going to do what I told it to do. And I didn't go looking for this, but I just, you know, this, article just sort of bubbled up and it's like, yeah, that's exactly what my big takeaway is for a lot of this stuff too. So it's it's done, it, Google seems to be pretty happy with it so far and I think they're continuing with all of those projects. Um, nothing's for free. Everything that's good is gonna have to come with some kind of a cost for sure. So there are a couple of reasons why not everyone in the world is using Rust. It is a lower level language, more akin to C than it is to Perl. So there is some, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily the best uh, programming language for rapid prototyping. I would say it's far better than C for that, but it's not, you're not going to get stuff going quite as quickly as you would with a Perl or a Python. Um, the biggest challenges that I see really are the initial learning curve and the relative youth of the project. I think the first release of Rust was in 2015, I believe which is just a baby compared to most of the other stuff that we come across. Um, and the big challenge there is of course, that some of the third party dependency or third party libraries are still evolving. And that's always a little bit of a, there's always a little bit of a dance you have to do there to keep things uh, up to date, but not so far up to date that things are breaking. There are some, it's kind of, it's not too dissimilar from some of the earlier, the way node JS is where there's, a lot of stuff happening all at once. And then so you have to kind of make sure everything's reconciled and the versions are correct. Um, but as with other projects, uh, this will calm over the years as the uh, as the different projects kind of get to be to stable releases and settle down on everything. I haven't had too much issue with uh, versioning. There was, I had one issue once where I had to tell it to use a certain version of a package and then that issue went away. Uh, I guess it was fixed on the back end. And after that, I haven't had any problems of just running, installing Rust all on Ubuntu 22, and then just building my code. And it so far so good, minus that one issue. The uh, learning curve is probably a bigger issue. It's a different language. It It has to be because the way that it sort of prevents you from making lots of mistakes. And the way it does that is that it gives you a very limited path forward to solve a lot of problems. And at first, it's frustrating. And you really, really want to fight this thing because you know, 
you know if you do this thing with this data, it's going to be fine, but it's not going to let you do that thing with that data because that's ultimately not a smart way to do a thing with that data. Um, it is going to be very opinionated, and there's there's no winning unless you just follow it, <laughs> do what it says to do. So it can it can be really really frustrating at first, and I think some of that is dependent on how you know what languages you've done in the past, um, or just how much experience you have in general with memory managed languages versus the kinds where you have to free. And I don't even know which is better. Uh, I, I've heard some schools of thought say that if you start with Rust and you've never done anything else, it'd probably be a lot easier because then you would just it would just make sense. Uh, but if you're coming from C, there are going to be some points of aggravation at first until you get your mind around the way the compiler wants you to manage the data. So just a very simple example of that. Um, is that samples? Yeah. So I have a super, super simple source file here. And all it does is define two structs, kind of like C-ish. And then it instantiates one, instantiates one that uses the first one, and then another one that also uses the first one. And if you run this, it's going to complain because you gave over ownership of this F value to this B1, and then you tried to give over ownership again to this B2, and it's not going to let you do that. Um, if you come from C and you're, you're thinking more in pointers, or if you come from Python or Java or whatever, you're thinking more of the compiler is going to copy it or reference count it however it needs to, then this is going to seem a little frustrating. But in fact, you have to consider where the data is owned whenever you're moving data around or uh, doing references to data that multiple people have access to. When you get accustomed to it, it becomes pretty easy. It's just at first it's confusing and frustrating because you have to kind of think about this stuff. Um, but it, as you adjust, it, it gets a little bit easier. Um, or I should say a lot easier. It doesn't really, it's not really a thing for me anymore. I, I can see it coming from a mile away. So the um, project that we are working on at King County, uh, we have a public GitHub repository. It has a number of sub packages. Uh, the main one, the big one being Evergreen. Um, I also have a small sort of net server-ish type thing that's uh, threaded that I use as a uh, tool for some of the servers that run within Evergreen. There is a Mark library, um, SIP2, and then I also have SIP2 mediator code in here for whenever we have SIP2 mediator merged into Evergreen or whenever we start using it at KCLS. I'm not sure you know, which will come first, but the uh, this was, a to me, a pretty clear benefit of using Rust over Perl because of the, the nice threading functionality. It's, it's a nice, tiny little binary that works really fast to do the mediator back to Evergreen. And then I also started on a SIP server a while back, which I'm probably going to not use. Um, the mediator is a better solution in the long run. It's much more flexible. Uh, but there is some stuff in here I wanted to leave in case it was a value down the road. And we've had one contributor so far, Jason Stevenson. Yay, thank you. So yes, of course we take patches. Um, yeah. So documentation. There's um, a framework for documentation built into Rust that is just sort of agreed upon and defined up front. And if you run a command to build the documentation, it will do that. So on my Valky server over here, I ran the command to build documentation for our evergreen uh, code. And so this is all documentation that I wrote. Um, and then, you know, it allows you to just, it just generates some, some static HTML that you can bounce around through to see all the documentation. It doesn't require any third-party products or anything like that. It's just baked into how Rust builds stuff. And then um, what I mentioned before about the unit tests, this is really, um, for whatever reason, this has been really instrumental in me to encouraging me to write more tests. Because what I found is having the test written as part of the documentation and then having that be compiled and shown in the compiled documentation is extremely useful for learning how the API works. The 
most of the docs that you see in the Rust community in general is a combination of description and then some kind of unit test that shows you this is how the code actually runs. And the um, way that this is handled in the code is it is just uh, regular old documentation and then it uses markdown style, the three ticks and anything inside here when you do uh, make test or sorry, cargo test, it will find these in the documents and it will execute these all right out of the documentation. And like I said before, this has been a pretty big deal, pretty big deal to me. It really, it really makes the docs and the uh, testing a lot, lot simpler. Okay. And just, uh, just to make sure you don't think I'm lying. It will, uh, again, not very beefy service here, but it will go through and find all the unit tests uh, in the documentation. You can also do tests outside of documentation where it's just standalone test files. Um, but um, yeah, most of these are documentation tests in line with the uh, code docs. Part of my um, goal with the work that I've been doing on this over the last couple of years is trying to create an environment where it's conceivable that people could jump in to writing Rust code for Evergreen fairly easily with code that doesn't look too exotic. Um, you know, once you get past the, the Rustisms, that the basic flow of information and how things are built more or less makes sense. So the readme on the Evergreen project over here just shows a example using the Rust editor component. So we use we use the editor throughout the Perl side. Um, it's a layer that sits on top of CStore and it makes uh, communicating with the database essentially really easy and fairly readable, I think, for the most part. So um, I think anyone who's ever written Perl code and used an editor could kind of figure out what's going on here. There's some funky stuff like with the question marks that are very rusty that, that I can get into in more detail if you're interested. The, um, the way that it's making JSON hashes is look a little, you know, looks a little odd. These are macros, so like pre-compiler macros. Um, but the rest of this, it's sort of key access, similar to how JavaScript objects are key access. And then you have an editor that can begin transactions, create things, search for things, update things, delete things, roll back transactions, all that fun stuff. I don't think that this is terribly difficult to understand. So if we're talking about adopting something that is that has the benefits of all the stuff I was talking about before, and if the main concern is just really, I don't know how to use this stuff, it's going to be hard to learn. I think it's possible that we can create APIs that paper over a lot of the more difficult parts and allow people to use the editor and similar things in a way that they're used to in the Perl code. So um, this is kind of what I've been doing, and especially recently over the last couple of months. And in part, while I've written a lot of the um, a lot of the evergreen code that I have, is isn't just because it might be useful down the road, but it's also because I wanted to make sure that the underlying stuff, the underlying APIs, the editor, the way we send, uh, communicate over the Redis bus and everything is simple and clear enough that no one really has to be an expert in the language. Um, I can already say that I am absolutely not an expert in Rust. It's got some really bizarre stuff in there that I, I still don't know how to make sense of it. Uh, sometimes I'll read things and I just have no idea what that even means. And I found that I don't have to. There are maybe some stuff, some applications out there, especially if you're getting into the um, uh, like the more bare metal type stuff, or if you're using the unsafe variants. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that just yeah, I don't even bother. I don't even try to figure it out. I just use what to me seems to be the sort of canonical safe Rust, and just enough. Um, underlying plumbing so that you can make certain things easier. Like in C, um, for example, this there's different ways to do it, but one of the ways that we've been doing it is you would 
write a JSON string out and then escape it to be a string and then parse it in line. And then that's how you would get a simple struct like this. Whereas like this, you're just defining it as more of a JSON-y type thing that looks like an object. And um, some of you <laughs> may be raising an eyebrow at this one here. Uh, I did steal that from Perl. So when Perl, when a object in Perl is given a class, it is blessed. And so I kind of stole that. We can call it whatever else. It doesn't matter what we call it. But I created a way in here using these macros to build IDL class objects by hand without having to know the array positions or any of that stuff, similar to how you have the field mapper in Perl. Um, but since it's not Perl, we can't auto-generate all of those functions. So instead, you essentially create a hash with a special key in it called class name. Um, and these, I, I am not, again, not being an expert, I'm not an expert on defining macros for Rust. This is a just basically a papering over of a JSON library macro that allows you to build JSON objects by hands. And this just wraps it and then does a little bit of extra magic in the case of the, uh, the blessed variant. So that it, you know, it's already parsed the IDL and figured out what the class names are, the valid field names and all that stuff. So now I'll go through a couple of things that I think are nice that I've added to some of the projects. So um, I implemented the WebSockets layer, uh, and this will be a replacement for both the WebSocket D package that we're using now and a replacement for the um, OpenSurf WebSocket C parts. So those are two different pieces that work in conjunction. This just does both of them at once, and it's just a simple threaded server. And there's an issue on Evergreen land, which has its own tag called uh, parallel requests. And this is a, something that pops up when the JavaScript client code sends an unruly number of requests all at the same time to the server. And it can cause backend services to get flooded. And it, it'll max out the max children for, you know, pcrud as a typical one or actor is often one that's called. And so um, I just added a request throttling mechanism to the Rust WebSockets. And it's a configurable amount, but by default, if one client has more than eight requests out on the message bus to Evergreen at a time, anything after that it goes into a backlog and then it will you know, throttle them in as slots are opened up. So the uh, amount is configurable. I chose eight because I think that's what um, XML HTTP request does by default, or it used to at some point. But um, if you want to be a little more bold, bump that up to 20, whatever, as long as it's not you know, 500, which is sometimes happens with some of these big interfaces doing batch operations. Um, I have implemented an HTTP gateway. It's the same format as the existing OpenSurf one. The uh, only addition here is, and I mentioned this on a thread, um, uh, on the Evergreen tech list a while back. Um, I really wanted to make better use of, oh, I got to restart the service, I think. Let's see, whoops, where am I? Did I stop everything? get that going. OK, yeah, I didn't have everything running. Okay. Let's see if that link works now. Where'd you go? There you are. 
Okay. Um, we've done similar things like this in the past. I wanted to kind of more formally encode it into this Rust gateway. So it's just the HTTP gateway. It has the service param, method param, and then the param, repeatable param. <laughs> um, and so here it's just doing a pcrud call. And the, the, the thing that's different here is that there's a format called hash and it just returns vanilla JSON hashes in this case. The um, values are encoded again with the underscore class name to indicate the IDL class. And then it just uses the field names for the fields. And there's a variant of this that's just called hash where um, it will only return values that have, it'll only return keys that have a non-null value in them. So there may be some case where records have a lot of null stuff in it and you don't want it, but so you can just tell it not to include that. But uh, in this case, that was the um, owner field was null, so it was going away when I did the regular hash variant. Um, we, you know, we we interact with a number of third parties at KCLS, and um, having to use the IDL seems to be kind of a consistent bugaboo for integrating third parties. And more than once, I've seen. Uh, people, instead of actually properly using the IDL, using the, the, the Perl libraries and C libraries or what have you to translate the mess, the data that they get over the wire into an IDL object type thing where the field names match the array positions and all that. A lot of times people will just go in and access the array directly, the, the sort of hidden array, which is not meant to be seen. And um, to me, it's like, if it's just that easy to just do that, people are gonna do that instead. A lot of times, so I'm hoping to kind of force forego some of that and instead offer an interface that's at least, um, you know, it, it defines the fields. And so if the IDL itself does change, it's not going to affect something that you're doing on the front end if you're just passing hashes around. And um, I plan to start using this as well. On um, we have a number of patron-facing uh, UIs that are in the works where I don't. You know, they just don't need the whole IDL. They don't need the parser. They don't need all that stuff. They're pulling down just a couple of different bits of data. And and up till now, I've been writing API calls that essentially hash my stuff for me. Uh, but over time, I'd like to move to this so that we can use the same API essentially, but just tell it to return hashes instead of um, the network values. So if I just get rid of the format hash on the end there, then it's going to go back to, oh, wait, did I mess something up? What did I do? Hmm. There it goes. Um, it'll go back to the traditional wire level message protocol. So this this would be the default data as as with the existing gateway. Okay. Um. As I mentioned before, there is router in Rust. And I, let me see here. I'm going to fire this up using the Rust router instead. And I'm going to do that by. telling the um, control script to not actually start the router. And then I'll use my restart script up here, which is doing all of my rusty stuff, including the router. Well, that's going, I'm gonna go over here. So I still have my mashy set up across these two VMs. Uh, 
let's see. Okay, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I'll do the. I'll go ahead and show this. Um, so the Rust router I added is the summarize command, and it just returns JSON. Um, actually, let me do that so I can pipe it. Oops. Uh, Bill, sorry to interrupt. It looks like we lost some audio, both on Zoom and uh, feed loop. Yeah, it looks like it's on both of the uh, feed loop and uh, Zoom. Sorry, it's still not coming through. Um, if you do need to uh, leave the meeting and come back in, that might fix that issue. Uh, is anybody to hear anybody, sorry, able to hear me at least through chat? Okay, so we can hear me.
All right, folks, we'll have a, they'll come back in. Thanks for giving me the confirmation. Okay, am I back? Yes, you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, battery died. Okay, let's see here. Get the screen going here. Okay. I'll stay on the original video setup this time. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, I was thinking, I, I'm not sure how much, I'm not sure where I cut out exactly. Um, the, uh, yeah, so I was just mentioning that there's some interesting useful data here uh, that the router reports and um, some stuff moved around. The um, the other uh, application, which is newish, not really. It's just Surfshell, but um, it does have evergreenish pieces to it, kind of like Surfshell does with the login. But uh, now it's sort of you know under the banner of evergreen with the with the eg prefix. So obviously I called it eggshell, um, and it's meant to be a Surfshell clone, effectively with a few additional, just nice to have features. I, um, I like the, there have just been a few times when I've been using Surfshell where I thought it'd be nice if certain things were a little bit easier. Um, and then also if it had just a little bit more view into what was going on into the, into the evergreen ecosystem. And it's fairly easy to add new stuff to it. So I thought I'd demo some of those. Um, let's see here. So first of all, it has a, a, just a simple command here where if you, if you log in, then there's a command called rec auth, which simply passes the auth token from the previous login as the first parameter to the API call. So this pcrud call requires an auth token as the first param. Using the auth token as the first param is pretty much the de facto standard for how we do that. Not always, but generally speaking, that's what it does. So it kind of just tidies that up for you, and then you can make calls without having to copy paste the auth token into the command line. Um, by default, it returns values in this kind of hash format that I was demoing before on the gateway side, where it has a class name just encoded as underscore class name. And then you have regular human readable key value pairs for the data. Uh, but if you need to see what's on the actual wire, there's a pref for that. And then you get the wire protocol as, as Surfshell does now. Uh, 
I've come to appreciate the hash version. Um, there's, uh, okay, yeah, I've already demoed that, demoed that next part. Um, I also added, uh, I test C store a lot, and I get tired of typing out the requests, open our list of C store, almost a C store, da, 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 da. So there's just this little shorthand in here for uh, executing C store commands directly. Um, and this can make some troubleshooting a little bit easier. Um, do, 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 demo those. I also, because I've been doing a lot of work on SIP with the SIP mediator and working on improving the SIP on our side, we use SIP fairly heavily at King County. So it's very handy to me to be able to test things. So um, the egg, the eggshell um, uses the SIP2 crate that I've created, um, which is available by itself on the crates, the Rust crates site. Um, to communicate with the SIP backend and send and receive requests. And right now on the server that I'm on, I'm also running SIP to mediator. So it's essentially acting as a nice little test bed for that. Whoops. So I just sent this SIMP login request and then it'll spit out the entire SIP response. Um, a more interesting response might be something more like an item information request. So, this is uh, you know, just running a SIP query via SIP2 mediator, pulling in the item info from the Evergreen database. And of course, as with um, uh, regular Surfshell, it's all scriptable. I cannot type. You do have to log in first, so that will have to be the first thing you do in any kind of situation like this. Oh, not N, I think I need E. There we go. So you can have SIP, um, simple scriptable SIP lookups. Might be useful for a monitoring system or something like that. Um, I added a feature. So I also, you know, I, I'm sure many of us spend a lot of time in the database and a significant portion of that for me often is just, what's the ID of the org unit with branch BR1 or whatever. And so I added a minimal kind of read only um, DB option in here where it can, it can pass certain very simple commands off to a database. You do have to turn it on by default for, uh, you know, just security reasons. And it it disables the option if you try to run it um, in a script or not via TTY. So if you're sending commands into Excel, you can't do the with database thing just for safety. But if you are just typing stuff in by hand, then you can do simple searches like these, um, and it will just produce output from the uh, from the database and then run it through the idealization stuff. Let me just demo that real quick. So pretty much pretty much what you'd expect. Um, I don't I don't know yet if this is going to be super useful or if it's more of a security concern than anything, but um, thought I'd try it out, see how it goes. Um, let me come back to that. There's one other thing I wanted to mention, and that was um, well, no, I'll get to that in a second. Sorry, I'm bouncing all over the place here. I know it's a little bit frenetic. I should probably just clean up some of these tabs. Okay. Um, and then as one of my uh, steps toward really genuinely and in all seriousness, hoping that we can move toward Rust, at least for the C stuff in the, in the short term, um, I have started porting C store um, and I'm just calling it R store for now. And it currently does, um, the CRUD actions, create, retrieve, update, delete, and JSON query. And I am positive there is some functionality missing somewhere, but um, all the basic stuff I've done so far seems to be doing the thing. 
and then kind of in keeping with adding trying to add a little bit of you know icing to everything something that i've always wanted on sea circle but have never attempted to do is the ability to retrieve all the values from a field or from an object except certain fields um, and then the common case there for me is a bib record i rarely need the mark and it's bulky so i added just an exclude um, keyword to json query so that you can grab so give me everything except whatever um, and let me just demo how i got that working real quick um, let's see i don't have my usual tmux stuff going here so um So that's JSON query implemented in Rust with one little additional tweak there. And of course, it's doing the hash base output because I'm using the eggshell variant. Um, one other thing that I added, uh, and this might be a little more interesting because I have a different service running. Oops. Fill that real quick. Actually, I don't even know why I killed that, but or tried to kill it. it doesn't even make sense. Um, I don't need to. Mm, nope. There's also a circ, and these are all the the stuff that I've worked on as far as services are concerned are, of course, minimal at this point. They're just part of it again is making sure that the pieces that are built on the underlying layers are going to be useful for building higher layer logic. So I wanted to try a couple of different things out. Um, one thing I added to is, uh, and this is really so far just on the Rust side, is a variant of introspect, which does, it's called introspect, is it names? No, summary, that's what it is. So introspect summary, uh, open iOS. And it, it returns just a minimal version of the API with uh, parameter names and a little indicator as to whether or not a parameter is required. And I find this helpful because often I just need to remind myself what the parameters to a function are. So this is just kind of a quick um, export of that. And of course you can do the same thing with C store or RS store in this case. And it gives you the entire thousands upon thousands of APIs that are registered with the system. Let's see. All right, I got about 15 minutes. I think I'm just about done. Let's see here. Um, a little bit about the service work I've done so far. Um, the way I coded them is the services run as standalone binaries. That means if you want to, um, you can manage services via systemd or similar. Um, and that's just kind of nice because it manages the PID files and you can send signals via systemd and all that. Uh, I find it to be pretty handy. Um, of course, you don't have to use that. We can, if you know, if we want to use these things, we can still just have open source control execute the binaries directly, as opposed to going through something like systemd. Um, they are threaded, so there's no reason to fork really in Rust. The um, threading mechanism, like any good threading mechanism, is going to spread the load across however many CPUs you have, use of whatever RAM you give it. There's really no reason to get into forking on these and the threading uh, provides a lot of safety as I noted before on the rest side. Um, one of the changes with Redis is that the, the way it's designed, it's possible for um, workers. So in, 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 in traditional Evergreen, you have a listener, all the API calls come into the listener, the listener distributes the calls down to the workers with uh, direct drone delivery uh, which is implemented on the uh, Rust stuff, but not yet on the Perl side, though I do have a working branch that'll do that too. Um, the listener itself no longer is in the in the mix. So API calls are dropped on to the Redis bus with the correctly formed address, and then the worker is hungry hippo the requests off the bus, and you don't have to have that single point of 
funneling everything through one process, which has in the past caused problems with, um, I recall OpenILS Actor being one of the troublesome services where for some reason, too much data going through, I don't recall the details exactly, but the listener would fail. And then once the listener failed, the whole service is dead. So this just pull, allows the workers to pull them off directly. And the listener's only job is to manage the workers, make sure there are enough of them running or not too many of them running. And again, we can port the Perl stuff to this. I don't know if I get into the C stuff, that would be a messy job, I think, but it's certainly possible. And then a couple of things I added are parameter type and count enforcement. So um, in the Rust code, oops, I keep bouncing around to the wrong place. Um, there's, let's see. Where is that? Is that message? Uh, that is, no. Ah, there we go. So there is a uh, enumeration of parameter type or count options. And then the parameter types are based on just regular JSON structures. So if I do a query against circ, well, let me just do this real quick. So check-in takes two parameters, a string and a hash type thing. And it occurs to me now I should, I should augment this introspect to show that this is a string and that's a JSON object. But if I want to call this with too many parameters, it will tell me you're using the API wrong. If I call it with incorrect parameters, it will tell me the first thing was supposed to be a string, but instead you sent us a number one, which is not what we want. So I don't know. I think that's kind of neat, um, which is the stuff I just did also showed that. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, you know, I'm just going to skip this. I want to leave room for questions. It's not really all that critical for the, the discussion today. Uh, and then one other thing that's just kind of fun and in all likelihood we'll never use it, who knows. Uh, but there's this really interesting project called WebAssembly, which is um, a way, which is essentially a um, a sandbox in the browser that can run compiled code. So you can run Rust, for example, or probably C++ or probably lots of other things too. Uh, but you can, you can create these bundles of low level code that, then, that is then loaded and executed in the browser. Um, notably, these two surf shell tabs I'm using, these are both WebAssembly apps. So the browser generally is just responsible for providing a little bit of glue between the lower level machine that's running and displaying content say that you got from the machine or sending values from the higher level ui down to that machine um, but this is something that's pretty well supported in rust um, and here's a, a really fun example of the um, um oh what's it called the what's his name game of life uh oh my god i forgot his name well the milton bradley guy <laughs> no, really, no, I, no. I, just, I was just thinking that. <laughs> um, I don't think it's a Milton Bradley guy, but uh, Con Conrad Conway. That's what. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah. So this is the simple. It's it's the game of life. It's a simple thing where you have a little on and off blocks in a grid, and the the blocks behave differently depending on the disposition of the blocks around them. So you run it, and it just fun t fun patterns emerge and things like that. This is the first. Um, uh, thing on the Rust uh, web assembly site where they show you how to build this. So this thing in here is all running Rust all inside of a browser. There's, I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 lines of JavaScript that do some stuff that act as the glue and then all of the logic to uh, build the little blocks and determine the state of the blocks is happening in Rust running inside of a small sandbox runtime running inside of a browser. It's kind of neat because if we ever wanted to do any really heavy processing in a browser. Um, for whatever reason, this could be something that could be used, but uh, I don't know. I just thought that was kind of cool.
And I think I left some time for some questions. Okay, uh, so even if you are viewing this on Feedloop, you do have the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, so feel free to do that if you have a question for Bill. I also just wanted to give a reminder, everybody, that we do ask for the presentation slides, um, so they will be posted as well as a recording. Uh, Jane put something in chat. Uh, she thanks you for the presentation, Bill. Uh, can I ask about your dev setup or Rust using Rust Analyzer? Yes. Um, I highly recommend, I, I, I don't use it day to day, um, but VS Code with Rust, the Rust components baked into it is a great way to learn the language because uh, Rust Analyzer, as you pointed out, will show you in real time um, what you're doing wrong, it'll make suggestions, recommendations, things like that. So if, you, if you're just getting started out, especially if you've used VS Code before, the Rust VS Code stuff is also top notch. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm at a point now where I don't use Rust Analyzer or VS Code. I just do it in Vim at this point. Um, but yeah, definitely good tools to use. And there are ways to plug in Rust Analyzer. I know with Neo Vim, I'm pretty sure with Vim as well. Uh, I haven't, I haven't done that yet though. But the best thing you can do when you're learning, honestly, is just the rustlang.org book. It starts from the beginning, walks you through it. Uh, and I went through that whole thing way back when, and it was a huge benefit. Well, if anyone is interested in hacking the, um, oh, thanks for the link, Chris. Chris put a link to the uh, the book in there. Um, the KCLS Evergreen Rust stuff, uh, obviously happy to accept um, patches. Um, if we want to make any of that more sort of officially Evergreen, then uh, you know pieces of that could be brought over into community repositories. But, um, and I'm also, I love talking about it clearly, so I'm happy to, help or talk about stuff I'm doing or, or anything like that if anyone wants to dig in. OK, I think we're probably good, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I can do All my right, think, victory yeah. stretch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for your time. Uh, this was a really good way to kick off the pre-conference and the conference week uh, as a whole, too. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you joining me. Okie dokie. Uh, so uh, we're a few minutes out till three, and then we have a half hour break uh, within the pre-conference. Um, we do have uh, the exhibitor hall that is up, or rather it's called Exhibit Hall and Feed Loop. So please take some time to visit. Um, not every uh, booth will be manned, so to speak, virtually, um, like it will be at the conference, just because there's certain different uh, 
schedules that some people have, um, but uh, they are up uh, with some information in there. Uh, so please take some time to look at it. And uh, let me get the slide up for the next presentation while we're at it. Sorry, I like so many screens up. 